And uh, thank you uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to come and talk to you all today. So um, just to echo on the comments made already, you know, the, the challenges the refining and downstream and energy sector faces are enormous. But, you know, with the right technology and the right support and the right drive behind it, there's all, every chance that the uh, downstream industry can play its you know, vital role as what, securing the uh, energy supplies of Europe, but also being a, a key part of that energy transition. So very much on that theme, that is what I'm coming to talk about today. So effectively, the, uh, the, the topic of my discussion is around the challenges and strategies that refiners face in this decarbonizing world. I'm effectively going to break it into two different sections. First, providing a little bit of background around how our company, Wood Mackenzie, see the world energy transition and the role that fuels will play within Europe. And then secondly, thinking a little bit more around the refiners. What specific challenges do they face? How can they be part of the transition? And also maybe finishing off on what sort of support and uh, mechanisms might be needed to enable them to actually succeed and thrive in that space. So first of all, covering around some of the energy transition and market drivers. So how do we see the world evolving? How do we see energy needs within Europe? So what I'm showing on this chart here is effectively Wood Mackenzie's view of the energy transition. Now clearly for everybody there is a high degree of uncertainty as exactly how the world is going to achieve this energy transition and what targets are going to be met. So what we're showing on the, the left hand side is effectively the um, global CO2 emissions related to the energy sector. Again, under the green line we're showing what a true net zero achievement looks like. So this is aligned with a one and a half degree global warming scenario. Uh, a second case, which is we're calling the pledges scenario, is related to a two degree uh, scenario being achieved. So again, this is largely related to a number of the uh, pledges and policies that have currently been announced globally. Not everybody has committed to a 2050 net zero. The third case in the sort of purpley brown colour is what we call Wood Mackenzie's base case. So based on current technology, policy, national targets and some of the other challenges which we'll come on to talk about, this is where at the moment we see the, uh, the global climate change reaching. Unfortunately, a slightly pessimistic view, we see the uh, targets falling fairly significantly short of both the one and a half and two, de two degree scenarios. And we see maybe the world ends up somewhere close to a two and a half degree global warming uh, scenario. Now again, um, there is still a uh, time to change the trajectory, but there will be need for further policy intervention, greater acceleration of technology and investment in order to achieve those more rapid scenarios. Moving on, so what does this actually mean for the oil and oil products and refining sector? Again, under the three same scenarios, we can look at global oil demand. So in simple numbers, if we think today's uh, global oil demand is somewhere around 100 million barrels a day, under the base case scenario, we still see by 2050 somewhere in the magnitude of around 90 million barrels of oil demand. And that is uh, effectively crude oil and condensates demand, which effectively says that we still largely need the vast majority of the upstream and refining and, and oil products infrastructure still in place. Um, of course, this is a global view. We still see uh, regions like, such as Europe and many of the other OECD countries having a much more rapid transition so therefore European demand would still be expected to decline significantly but as a global picture we still see there being fairly significant need for oil. Of course under the uh, more rapid transition scenarios if we take the one and a half degree uh, rapid transition scenario to net 50 um, we still see somewhere around 30, 33 uh, million barrels per day of oil demand so very significantly reduced two-thirds smaller but there still remains some level of uh, oil within the energy mix. Um, of course, we're all hopeful and optimistic that we will globally be able to achieve the, the net zero targets everybody would like to see. But of course, there are a number of challenges and barriers of which you know, many of the discussions today will be talking about. So with that in mind, we'll move on to think about well, what does this actually mean for, for Europe? So under this base case, uh, our Wood Mackenzie thinks about primary fundamental demand for the, uh, for the different sectors within Europe. So again, if we take uh, mainland Europe, EU, give or take, we're around uh, 12 to 13 million barrels of oil demand currently today. And that is split across a fairly wide range of sectors. The largest, of course, being the road transportation sector, passenger cars, trucks, vehicles, etc. 
And we can see uh, on the chart on the left hand side, we can see that that demand for those road transport fuels is uh, declining fairly sharply. And again, probably unsurprisingly, this is driven by a fairly rapid uptake of uh, electric vehicles within the passenger fleet and a slightly slower uh, transition and evolution of the heavy goods and trucking fleet. But uh, there are changes in other sectors also. Things like uh, use within aviation, marine, industry, they all have a part to play. We still see challenges in many of those hard to decarbonize sectors getting to a true net zero. And again, I think we'll come on to talk a little bit more around the challenges within the marine and aviation sectors and the need for liquid fuels within those. Um, overall though, what does this actually mean for the oil products that our refiners produce? And again, on the chart on the right hand seat, side, we can see what that actually translates to. Um, a couple of points to point out. Um, clearly, there is still under this base case a fairly significant demand for those oil products, but it is declining. We're going from a sort of 12 million barrel well down to a six to seven million barrels of demand by 2050. Again, that will result in a fairly significant decline in the, let's say, traditional uh, fossil fuel production and refining within Europe. But again, there is still significant demand for many of those key transport fuels, but also the other things like petrochemical feedstocks, bitumen, lubricants, and other non-combustible products as well. But the challenge and the change is going to be uh, significant. And again, under a more rapid scenario, we would see an even faster decline in these traditional uh, fossil fuel demand for liquids. So that's the demand side. If we move on to think about the supply side, well, where, is these, where are these products going to be coming from? What we're showing on this chart on the left is effectively a view of where do we think the refining capacity, either investments or closures are going to come from over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, clearly, there are already quite a number of new large-scale complex refineries under construction globally. The vast majority of these focused in Asia and the Middle East, largely China building quite heavily uh, petrochemicals integrated facilities, the Middle East adding some fairly large complex conventional refineries, largely looking to export those products, again going to become probably quite a key competitor with Europe. And uh, there's one obviously very large uh, refinery in Africa in, in currently starting up in uh, the Dangote refinery. So with that context in mind, there is quite a number of several million barrels worth of new refining capacity coming online globally. Um, what we start to see going forward over the next 10 and 20 years is as that global oil demand peaks, there will need to be a slight reduction in global capacity, which ultimately would result in closures of other uh, refineries. When we look at where we think potential refinery closures come from, it's likely going to be in those more mature economies that are seeing a more rapid energy transition and faster uh, decline in demand for those fossil fuels. So we're largely talking about North America and, and Europe, and also some of the more uh, mature economies in Asia, you know, Japan, Australia, Korea. So that is the challenge the, the refiners face, a declining demand for products, but also, you know, there are new capacity additions which are effectively going to help uh, supply some of that, fill some of that gap. And that creates a, an incentive to, uh, again, focus on competitiveness, focus on uh, continuing to provide that supply within Europe. If we take all of our uh, views together, we think about supply and demand fundamentals, the pricing and margins. What does that actually translate to? So what I'm showing on this chart here is effectively uh, an outlook for benchmark refining margins. We're showing three typical European refinery benchmarks here on a gross margin basis. So again, a typical hydro skimmer, low complexity asset, FCC cracking configuration, and a slightly more complex hydro cracking configuration. Um, probably don't need to spend too long talking about recent history, but clearly uh, you know, during the couple of years of COVID through 2020 and 21, uh, everybody has lived through probably some of the worst market and uh, you know, refining market environment that, that has been seen on record. And that has rather swiftly been followed by some record high margins uh, in the last uh, 18 months, which largely this sector has been benefiting from. Now, of course, uh, the, the, the depressed margin environment was obviously caused by the, the demand loss because of COVID. But following that, a number of refineries within Europe have closed. Global demand has largely recovered uh, back to almost pre-COVID levels. And uh, you know, a number of projects have also uh, been stalled and delayed. And the, uh, the market with sanctions on Russian products has tightened significantly, which has led to the current uh, outlook.
Now clearly over the next couple of years, we don't see that the current high levels of margins are going to be sustainable. Yeah, actually, when we look forward over the next five to 10 years, we, we see a relatively attractive market environment. We still see that market tightness across some of the key products such as middle distillates. Now, a lot of this view might be predicated on the fact that sanctions remain against products from Russia and, and other regions. That is obviously a very, uh, very uncertain outlook. But if we assume that those uh, sanctions remain and the diesel market remains relatively tight, we see a fairly attractive outlook for the European refiners. And again, slightly advantaging the uh, hydrocracking configurations, which again, typically have a higher uh, distillate yield. Going to uh, 2030 and beyond out to 2050, clearly we see the conventional fossil refining margins come under increasing pressure. And again, unsurprisingly, as we start to see the energy transition accelerate and that demand decline within Europe and some of those competitive pressures from, ex from external players, we do see that putting pressure on margins and that ultimately probably being the mechanism that will drive the rationalisation within the sector that is needed. So really that was what I want to share just to give a little bit of background of how we see the world evolving and what some of the big trends are. Hopefully no big surprises in there for everybody. Um, moving on to the sort of second and, and probably most important topic of all to think about the uh, carbon emissions perspectives from refiners. So again, we focused a little bit more on markets and margins, but actually how is carbon going to play a role for the refiners? So first of all, a little brief intro. Um, when we talk about carbon emissions, specifically from refineries, we tend to think of that in terms of how the greenhouse gas protocol defines carbon emissions. So again, uh, across three different scopes, one, two, and three. Um, scope one emissions are your direct emissions from a refinery. So again, this is from furnaces, boilers, heaters, power and utilities generation. So the, the CO2 and other uh, uh, emissions that come from those facilities. The scope two emissions are for a refiner are directly related to the uh, electrons and power that is purchased and consumed by the, by the refinery. So again, that might be running lights, heats, pumps, power systems. The scope three emissions is the most challenging of all. So this is the uh, emissions embedded associated with the supply chain and the end use of the products. So associated with purchasing crudes, transporting those crudes, and most critically when those products are then later combusted and the CO2 is generated at the, uh, at the tailpipe. So if coming along to think about this, um, what we're showing on the right hand side is for a typical barrel of oil, where do the emissions actually come out from that barrel of oil? So roughly uh, a barrel of oil, somewhere around 400 kilograms of CO2 are generated throughout the entire value chain life cycle of a barrel of oil. Um, a relatively uh, large amount are generated of carbon emissions are associated with upstream production. So this is things like drilling, um, the production, energy use on rigs, methane emissions, flaring, etc. There is quite a bit of diversity in upstream emissions. Some um, producers such as uh, Johan Sverdrup in the North Sea has integrated a lot of uh, low carbon technologies and has a much lower footprint. But again, similarly, some of the uh, crude production in the Middle East is also very low carbon because of uh, that those resources are much more accessible than some of the more challenging crudes to produce. Secondly, we look at crude transportation. So this is effectively pipelines or shipping to deliver the crudes to the refineries. Now, although uh, you know, VLCCs and large tankers uh, do generate significant uh, emissions, per barrel of uh, crude, it's still a relatively small part of the overall uh, emissions profile. The third part on the list is the actual emissions generated by the refinery itself. So these are the scope one and two emissions from the refinery, heaters, boilers, furnaces, etc. And again, this is quite a significant part of the overall carbon uh, generated. However, obviously, there is quite a big diversity within the refiners themselves. Those assets with high uh, energy efficiency and heat integration, using lower carbon fuels, or potentially in the future integrating uh, carbon capture type technologies would have a much lower scope one and two emissions from the refinery. Finishing up, uh, product transportation. So this might be tankers, rail, pipeline, truck distribution of products to the end market. Again, a fairly small uh, number overall, but not, not, not uh, insignificant. The big challenge the conventional refining sector will place is the end uh, use combustion of products. Fundamentally, if you combust 
gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, fuel oil within an engine to create heat or power or energy, uh, you generate a lot of CO2. And this is one that is not abatable. You can't abate the carbon emissions from the tailpipe. So this is probably the biggest challenge the, across the oil industry that, that the sector faces, that you can't abate the end emissions. So something else needs to be done. You know, upstream producers, transportation companies, refiners can all work on their scope one and two emissions to bring them close to or as near to zero as possible. But fundamentally producing those fossil based products is always going to have a scope three uh, challenge. There are of course obviously other solutions around integrating alternative sustainable feedstocks, um, using things like offsets or uh, investments into broader diversity which we'll come on to talk about. So as we discussed, moving back to think about the refiners themselves, I mentioned that there is quite a bit of diversity in the carbon intensity of refineries operations. So what we're showing on the left hand side is some analysis that uh, Wood Mackenzie has done to model the carbon intensity of refinery operations. If we take a global uh, refinery um, group of around 500 assets and we measure and model their carbon emission intensity, we can see that the range is actually fairly significant. So anywhere from between 100 kilograms per barrel of CO2 all the way down to sort of less than 20. So what drives this big diversity in the carbon intensity of refineries? It's actually quite a big number of uh, factors. Slightly conversely, the lower complexity, simpler refineries have a much lower carbon intensity. So by the less processing a refinery does, the less upgrading, it generally has less process units and less energy consumption. So simpler refineries actually have lower uh, per barrel energy consumption. At the same time, um, the degree of heat integration, heat recovery, um, etc. will again have a pretty significant impact on the intensity of a refinery's uh, total carbon emissions. Um, other key factors are the types of fuels a refinery uses. Most refineries in Europe are now using fuel gas or natural gas. Around the world a lot of refineries are still firing heavy feedstocks, fuel oils etc which have higher carbon uh, intensity. And again you know going forward integrating uh, electrical heating or, or lower carbon hydrogen might be a way to help abate some of those emissions. Um, smaller effects like flaring etc also add to the mix um, and again going forward items such as uh, integrating CCUS or other lower carbon technologies could go a long way to significantly reducing the uh, scope one or two intensiveness of refineries. On the right hand side we're showing a range of scope three emissions from refineries so again this is associated with the crudes they purchase, the products they produce. Um, again quite a, a broad range within the refiners again largely driven uh, by the types of products they produce. Those assets which are more focused towards producing non-combustible products, so that could be petrochemical feedstocks, lubricants, bitumen, which ultimately don't usually get combusted and turned into CO2, they would typically be expected to have a lower uh, carbon intensity because of that. So again, being able to measure these and being able to understand where different refiners sit on that spectrum is probably a very uh, important first step in being able to uh, manage the uh, carbon of the industry. One last thing to highlight, we've also highlighted in the sort of purpley colour those sites which are petrochemicals integrated. Maybe unsurprisingly some of the most carbon intensive operations are highly integrated sites because when you add the emissions from all the petrochemicals um, processing that creates carbon emissions. But at the same time on the opposite chart looking at scope 3 because a lot of those products don't end up becoming key transport fuels the scope three emissions intensity is actually a little bit lower for those uh, heavily petrochemicals integrated assets. So Woodmac quite often likes to talk about mar refinery margins and ranking and competitiveness of different assets and where they all sit relative to each other because ultimately you know, refiners need to generate margins and, and, and be profitable and sustainable. If we look at that dimension across the x-axis, this is some modelling work that we have done to map all 500 global refineries with where we think their margins were over the last couple of years. On the y-axis, we've also mapped the carbon intensiveness. Now again, going back a few years, that was less of a direct concern, but certainly within Europe, under schemes like the ETS, the carbon intensity is becoming increasingly important. Not only is it going to be an increase in cost, but also increasingly part of the refiner's social licence to operate. So as we can see, there's quite a mix globally. In an ideal world, a refiner would love to be 
able to generate a high margin while also having a lower carbon intensity. But again, that is not going to be available to everybody or at least everybody today. There are a number of refiners out there which are generating fairly attractive margins but have a very high carbon intensity and that therefore creates the challenge for them to think well, what are the ways that they could in a sustainable way reduce their carbon intensity and again we'll come on to talk about some of those technologies. At the same time some of those assets are actually already have made fairly uh, significant steps in reducing their carbon intensity but may currently be in a position where they don't have the strongest margins. So again, the focus for them may be on actually making the shift to what can they do in a more conventional way to improve their margins or profitability. There will also be a number of assets in the top left quadrant which have relatively low margins and relatively high carbon intensities. Those are going to be challenging to make the transition. Not every refinery is going to be able to go and make a full transition. There will need to be some rationalisation and it may be considered that those assets may be the most at risk. However, of course, we recognise that when thinking about a global basis, you know, some assets may be operating in those regions where the assets are subsidised or they aren't subject to uh, carbon pricing regimes and therefore may be more protected. Quick um, overview of the uh, CBAM. So this is the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism being introduced by the EU. So the intention here is to include uh, or introduce a tax on imports into the EU as a way to uh, help levelise the cost of and competitiveness of European production versus external producers that don't pay equivalent or similar carbon taxes. Um, currently, uh, oil refining and oil products are not included or within the initial phase of the CBAM, but we assume that in the coming years, by around 2028 or 2030, that oil and oil products will be included. So we have done a little bit of analysis to think about well, what might this mean for refinery margins and competitiveness. So over time, the um, carbon credits and free allocations to refiners for their scope one and two emissions is being reduced and ultimately will be phased out so there'll be no free allocations of carbon credits for refiners. That will in, uh, add a fairly significant cost to refiners and have a fairly significant reduction or a margin impact to Europe's refiners. So that is what we're showing in this green bar. We think by 2040, somewhere in the magnitude of around $4 a barrel of extra cost will be added to refiners. Now obviously that will vary significantly based on the actual intensity of different assets. To help try and offset some of that carbon cost to refiners within the EU, the CBAM will introduce a tax on imports of products, so those coming in from the Middle East, Asia, Russia, U US, if they are not subject to equal or similar carbon taxation and pricing, they will pay a tax to the EU under that system. Now we think that that will actually have the impact of increasing prices for all European uh, products, but ultimately will add back one to two dollars per barrel of margin to the European refiners because it will lift, lift prices and cracks. So I think while from that perspective the CBAM helps, it doesn't go 100% of the way to completely offset the impacts of the carbon cost to European refiners. Um, last couple of things to think about. So what can refiners do? If you are the CEO of your, of your company in downstream or refining, your investors, shareholders, boards will be looking for a plan that says, here's how I'm going to sustain and grow my revenue and margins, but also I now need to have a plan that shows how I'm going to reduce my carbon intensity and my carbon emissions. Quite difficult, uh, conflicting challenges, but there are a range of different strategies that can be deployed by refiners to uh, try and achieve these ends. And again, this might be at a portfolio level, high grading and focusing on those assets that are more competitive, lower intensity. It could be around uh, investing in uh, fuel and energy efficiency, um, shifting a focus to non-transportation fuels, introducing alternative technologies, and again, we'll come to talk about these a lot more, hydrogen, CCUS, biofuels, e-fuels, etc. Um, or even again, uh, some of those uh, carbon capture integrations with other industrial facilities. So ultimately, um, there is a long list of different options that refiners have. Just to give a little bit of an example, we think on the left-hand side, here are some of the major technology types that might be applicable to refiners. Most of these types of initiatives need to be investable and sustainable on their own, and each of them will have some impact to the either the scope one or two, 
emissions, so the, ref the emissions directly produced by the refinery, or the scope three emissions associated with the crude and the feedstocks. Um, slightly more challenging, so the these are all options that could be uh, implemented within a refinery gate to help improve the position. On the right hand side, there's some broader portfolio options. So again, uh, there might be potential to sell or downsize or close refineries, but again, that would only start to become palatable if businesses have found alternative options or other business lines tangential to what they're already doing. And again, that could involve um, conversions to biofuel producing, shifting fuels rail to electro uh, mobility, uh, integrating carbon capture, renewable power, or even becoming, uh, you know, as many companies are doing, selling loads as a service. Um, I'm about at time there, so I'll pause uh, and, and hand back to Ellen. But um, thank you uh, again for the time to uh, talk to you about some of these options and uh, looking forward to discussing.